To continue discussing the points highlighted by the curtain raiser, we have on the panel Melinda Klebog, Privacy Policy Director, Facebook, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, Bharat Pandey, Partner Umidya Network India, and Annabel Lee, Public Policy Lead for Data, APAC, Amazon Web Services. The discussion will be moderated by Anirudh Bhagman, Associate Fellow, Carnegie India. Hello and welcome to this session on personal and non-personal data. I have a panel of eminent speakers with me to discuss the issue of India's emerging data architecture, and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to them. In the past few years, India has taken a significant step towards creating a comprehensive framework for regulating the use and exploitation of data. There is a personal data protection bill being considered in parliament, and a government committee has published a draft report on the regulation of non-personal data. So uh, I just covered the broad contours of this framework in the curtain raiser. So I'm going to move straight towards today's discussion. And I'm going to frame two or three broad questions for our discussion and ask each speaker to give us their thoughts on that question. And towards the end of the discussion, we'll take some questions from the audience, but please feel free to keep typing in your comments and questions throughout the discussion. So I'm going to start off the first leg of our discussion by asking the speakers about whether they think developing countries like India have different imperatives when considering issues like data protection. Should we be thinking differently about the balance between privacy of uh, consumer privacy and compliance costs that data regulation uh, requirements are likely to entail? Or are there some non-negotiables that almost every country has to uniformly apply? And related to this is the question of whether India's bill actually strikes this balance. Are the requirements of taking consumer consent, for example, or for giving notice, uh, going to be too onerous for India's tech entrepreneurs, or are the trade-offs going to be worth it? So I'll request Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar to kick off the discussion. Mr. Chandrasekhar is a member of parliament, uh, an entrepreneur, and a member of the Joint Parliamentary Committee currently considering the bill. So he has perhaps the best vantage point from which to answer these questions. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, do you think India's bill actually achieves the right balance, or do you think there is significant work needed to be done? So so uh, do you want me to answer that, or do you want me to go okay, back to your I'm question on. and then come to the second one? Uh, you can start with the second one and then uh, come back. Well, you know, look, I, I think the fact that uh, there's a joint parliamentary committee that is sitting uh, and going through the bill and discussing it, and we've had uh, almost 52 sittings of the of the committee, uh, should tell you that the bill in itself is not uh, something that is working, and that the committee is obviously not going to rubber stamp this bill. It is going to redraw the bill. and. Uh, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, the question that you pose is moot because you don't know what the end product of this committee is. Uh, it's only when you see the end product that you can come to that conclusion whether uh, these balances are being struck. Uh, having said that, let me move to your question number one, which is the, the most. Uh, it's a funny question because uh, uh, throughout this process, uh, people would come in, witnesses would come into the committee and uh, and argue uh, as if privacy is a favor that is being done by the state uh, for the citizens. It's almost, I mean, many people, Anirudh, came up and asked this, is it too much for India? I mean, are we going to put pay to our dreams of a trillion dollar digital economy if we start the granting these rights? Excepting for the little fine print, which I, I tend to remind people uh, in seminars like this and witnesses who deposed in front of us, uh, 
that the citizens have already been granted that fundamental right to privacy by the Supreme Court. So there is no negotiation around that anymore. That is a given. And so if there is a balance that this bill attempts to strike, it is how do you protect the citizens' right to fundamental right to privacy, which is a const constitutional right, and the other three or four important issues. Uh, for example, for businesses to still grow and have a light touch regulation. So the whole issue of compliance. The second issue is the state's right to access data uh, in, uh, in the name of public safety or on occasions of public safety. And the fourth fundamental principle around which this bill is being considered today is that the structures and the institutions that, that are put in the bill uh, evolve the bill to uh, allow the bill and the jurisprudence around the bill to evolve, i.e. As, as few hard-coded issues of today and, uh, and not doing too much of vision and gazing into the future and predicting the future, but allowing the bill and allowing the institution, the DPA, to be of that capability, quality, caliber uh, that allows the uh, overall jurisprudence around privacy and data protection to evolve. So, um, I, I think I've addressed both those questions that you put out. It's not a uh, binary, uh, and if anybody assumes that it's a binary, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the citizen will just walk up and say, excuse me, I've already got that right, and I don't need to negotiate with you. Thank you for that, and I'll come back to some of these points later. Uh, I want to uh, turn to Ms. Melinda Kleber. Uh, uh, welcome, a very warm welcome to this panel. And I'd like you to begin by just addressing the same question that I posed to Mr. Chandrasekhar, which is, uh, do you think India's bill is actually striking the right balance between privacy and innovation? And uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar pretty forcefully made the point that, look, privacy is non-negotiable. We just have to uh, deal with the nuances and the specific uh, ways of operationalizing this right. Uh, I'd love to have your thoughts on this. Sure. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I apologize for <laughs> the technical difficulties on, on my end. I'm glad to be here. Um, so, you know, I, I agree that the important thing here is to strike that balance. Um, and I think that it's really important to strike that. To uh, deal with the nuances and the specific uh, ways of operationalizing this right. Uh, I'd love to have your thoughts on this. Sure, thank you so much for, for having me. I apologize for the technical difficulties on, on my end. I'm glad to be here. Um, so, you know, I, I agree that the... Sorry, not quite sure what to do with the delay. Did anyone else hear that as well? Yeah, yeah okay. but, but please continue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was saying, I, you know, I think it is the right, obviously the right thing to talk about striking that balance. Um, and I think that striking that balance will be key to ensuring the digital growth and data-driven innovation that is key towards uh, India's economy, but also the global economy. Um, I think there are a few dimensions that we need to keep in mind in terms of considering whether this is a, a well-balanced regulation. Um, one, I think, is whether this uh, the bill is consistent with existing uh, data protection regimes around the world. Um, and I think there are places where the bill is consistent and there are places where the bill is not consistent. Um, and the consistency is really key for two reasons. So one is for consumers' trust. Um, so consumers know that their data is protected wherever it goes around the world. But um, also for businesses who are seeking to comply with laws around the world. Um, and I think there is a lot that underpins this law, as well as other leading global privacy regimes, including strong individual rights, strong accountability for companies, and a really um, independent uh, kind of central regulator um, that will be key to implementing, interpreting the law over the long term. Um, and those and that consistency is important for businesses to ensure that they can operate globally um, in a consistent way and that they do, it doesn't the, the law doesn't lead to the fragmentation of services and, and the Internet around the world. Um, 
small differences um, may be manageable, particularly for global companies like ours, um, but small differences can add up for small businesses that are seeking to um, access global markets, that are seeking to, an entree um, into the global digital economy. And we have to, we have to be sure to balance what is appropriate for um, you know each country, which obviously each country has the right to regulate data in the way it see fit, sees fit, but also balance that with um, the kind of global picture. And I think India here really has an opportunity to be a leader in this space um, and and find a way that balances and and matches up with other leading regimes around the world. And in that way, it will facilitate the trust uh, of consumers. It will facilitate the trust between companies and the regulator, and also between um, people and and the government as well. And so that, that triangle of trust, I think, is what's really important here. And the global consistency is what will, will, will achieve that. Thank you for that. I just want to pick up on one uh, point you made, which is about small businesses. And I just wanted to ask you, in your experience, what are the kinds of compliance requirements that we've seen even in the current version of the bill that are more difficult for small businesses than for larger companies like yours? Yeah, so I think there are a few provisions in particular that are challenging. So one, um, I know there's been a lot of discussion at the Carnegie event around data localization. Um, I think that is obviously one that um, is going to be challenging for companies of all sizes um, to build a kind of a bespoke, uh, dedicated um resources to comply with that kind of localization mandate is going to be a significant um, lift. Um, and then when you think about that kind of multiplying potentially around the world and the signal that is sent through um, adopting that kind of regime, it starts to add up, for, especially for small businesses. Um, another area that I think is really critical is um, or will be particularly challenging for small businesses are the provisions around um, non-personal data and the kind, and I imagine we'll get to that in in this uh, in this panel. But the kind of um, ambiguity, vagueness, um, and uh, the 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 kind of structures around that, I think, will be particularly challenging for small businesses to comply with because of the novelty of that approach um, and that it hasn't been. Um, uh, you know, really fully fleshed out, at least in, in the bill itself. Um, and then finally, I think the area that will be, um, that could be challenging is around um, some of the uh, legal bases, or kind of, I should say, the, the lack of a variety of legal bases in this law compared to other leading global data protection regimes. I'm thinking in particular about kind of the over-indexing on consent um, and what that will require just in terms of back-end engineering and architecture um, to set up all of the consent flows. Um, there are separately reasons why that kind of um, uh, heavy approach on consent is not good for, for consumers and does not really lead to the privacy protective outcomes one might think. Uh, but I do think from a compliance perspective, that's a significant consideration as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let me turn next to Ms. Annabel Lee. Ms. Lee leads Amazon Web Services' public policy work on data-related issues. Uh, Ms. Lee, how well do you think India's proposed data framework fits in with the emerging global data regulation architecture? And in your opinion, what are the kinks in the framework do you think that we should be looking harder at addressing? Do you agree with some of the comments that have already come in? Um, th thank you so much, um, and uh, good good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, so, um, absolutely, I think in agreement with uh, what my colleague Melinda um, also mentioned um, just now. Um, I think for the most part, um, you know, India's proposed data privacy law is, is pretty aligned um, with other international emerging kind of modern privacy laws. I think um, from our perspective, um, 
the objectives of data protection and innovation are, are really not uh, mutually exclusive. In fact, they can be achieved. So I think that concept of a balance, I would push that a little bit further and say, no, you know, that we should be seeking ways actively to try and achieve both of those outcomes um, equally rather than, you know, trying to find some kind of compromise between the two. Um, and I think that increasingly, you know, ensuring that data is processed in a manner that companies can be accountable for and are responsible for is the only way that we can build trust in the digital economy. And I think that trust, you know, um, is shaky now, but but with a data protection law that will increase the trust um, in individuals. So it's absolutely crucial, I think, for digital innovation. Um, that being said, um, uh, the way we see it, I think specifically on the PDPB uh, bill, there are certain elements that is in the Indian PDP bill, which is, I would say, uh, sits apart from what we see typically um, from other international examples. I will very briefly just name a few of them. Um, I think the first one um, is uh, in relation to section 33 and 34, specifically on um, the requirements around uh, the ability to transfer um, data um, out of India, specifically sensitive personal data and critical personal data. Um, I think it's from our perspective, one of the challenges is just the many categories and the kind of uncertainty for businesses around what those categories entail, um, first of all, um, and some details around the actual kinds of data under each of these categories. So even though we have a list in SPD that's already been defined, um, you know, subject to, I guess, additional categories being added, those, those categories are extremely broad. And so that makes it very challenging from a compliance perspective. I think another thing that we've talked about, which is kind of quite different, um, in India's PDP uh, bill on section 33 and 34 specifically um, uh, is on the consent plus regime. So uh, consent being a first requirement for that transfer and then, you know, one of the other mechanisms being met. Um, I think we see typically um, consent as being one rather than consent plus. Um, and I think we've had many conversations now on, you know, um, what the role of consent is and, you know, whether or not consent is necessary in some of these cases, but that does sit different from others and will be operationally challenging um, um, from, a, from an ease of doing business perspective. So so just two very um, broad, uh, broad comments on, on 33 and 34 there. Um, uh, Another kind of element where I think India stands apart from, from the other international frameworks is in relation to Section 14. Um, this is where we've seen that um, the grounds for processing data are still fairly narrowly scoped. Um, and we have, I think, on, on numerous occasions, um, asked for additional grounds to also be recognized um, for processing. Um, uh, specifically, I think um, the, the pre-approval requirement is, is particularly challenging, and that's something that should be reviewed. And then, um, you know, one of the, the last things that I think uh, is, is extremely different, I mean, candidly, India is really first in the world for this, um, is, is um, kind of the, the clause uh, in Section 91 on non-personal data. Um, and I think um, the general question that has been raised, whether or not it's appropriate for um, a personal data protection law to be addressing non-personal data in the first instance. And um, secondly, uh, you know, the potential for um, discouraging business innovation and growth uh, as it is such a broad kind of, you know, enabling provision, if you may, without really any of the safeguards on, say, for example, ensuring that proprietary, intellectual proprietary rights are still met. Um, uh, that's that's one example. It lacks any safeguards around consideration for privacy, really, um, especially if we're thinking about data that had been anonymized um, and then, you know, it's non-personal data and then could risk um, re-identification if combined in in many data sets because of um, very broad non-personal data sharing. So I think some of these concepts, um, you know, again, are quite, quite different from our perspective compared to other data protection laws. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And uh, before I turn to uh, Mr. Varad Pandey, I just wanted to ask Mr. Sandeshekar if there are any quick reactions to some of these points that have been raised, or would you prefer I, to come back? Anirudh, I, I said in the beginning, uh, the bill that is uh, that has come to committee is clearly not the bill that's going to come out of committee. I mean, I can only say that. Uh, I think uh, we're all uh, grown-up people and we understand the the importance of this bill. This bill we see, and a lot of us in the committee see, as an absolute enabler for the future of the digital economy in India. So um, mm. that, along with the fact that we have to ensure the fundamental right to privacy, uh, 
is a balance, not a compromise. It's not an A or B. We want to do A plus B plus C plus D, and if possible, an E. So, you know, let's see what uh, what comes out. But uh, uh, most of the points that uh, both the ladies have mentioned are points that are known to us and mm-hmm. and uh, known not just to me, but to a number of people on the mm-hmm. committee. Uh, they are being debated. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me turn to Mr. Varad Pandey and uh, Mr. Pandey is a partner at Omidya Network India where he leads strategy, impact and new initiatives and what I wanted to ask you is not just about whether the bill strikes this balance but also how do you actually operationalize some of the finer aspects of the bill and I believe you've also been doing some research on uh, say the aspects of operationalizing consent and making it easier to actually uh, obtain consent and to operationalize it. So over to you, Mr. Pandey. Yeah, thank you, Anirudh, and um, congratulations to you, Rudra, and the team for putting together another formidable summit. And thanks for having us. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to bring in one aspect to this discussion, as you said, which is really about the voice of the citizen a little bit. I think. A lot of the discussion on the data architecture is, uh, um, I think, regulatory and legalistic. And I think uh, I wanted to share a few uh, recent learnings from the consumer perspective, from the citizen perspective, that may help inform this debate. With your permission, I'll share a few slides, uh, if you give me uh, a few minutes. Sure. Um, Great. Are you able to see my slides, Anirudh? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, great. So the the broad point I wanted to make was that, you know, um, based on um, based on a lot of, um, uh, you know, at at the highest level, right, as uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar said, one of the key aims of the data protection legislation is to give citizens more agency control over their data. Right. And to a large extent, consent has been uh, the primary tool uh, to give this agency to citizens. But we also know that consent is a is a fairly complex concept. And more importantly, uh, I'll argue it is sort of broken. And therefore, we need to think hard about um, uh, about a whether we can fix consent. And I have some interesting insights to share with you on that question. And then also, how can we go beyond consent if our if our aim really is to uh, is to empower the citizen to think to to um, uh, be, to be a important part of this discussion. Um, consent is broken, so this is uh, something I, I suspect many of many of the folks will agree with. But really, I think the way consent has been talked about since over the last few decades is really a top-down legalistic uh, compliance um, orientation uh, discussion. And in reality, as we all know, and we do as well, consumers struggle with consent, right? And this is to some extent well known. Uh, but some recent work uh, on this just, I think, uh, shines the light on this question. So NIPFP in 2019 uh, did an experiment where they uh, quizzed a group of urban English speaking college going students to understand the privacy policies of five apps that we all are familiar with. And how did they do? Uh, Not very well. The students scored an average of 5.3 on 10. And to give you a sense of how complex these uh, privacy policies were, uh, they, they found that, you know, the level of complexity is of a Harvard Law Review paper. And so expecting, um, you know, every every citizen or consumer to be able to uh, deal with the cognitive load that that uh, entails is actually um, obviously quite challenging. The second interesting study a few years ago was, uh, you know, you could argue the first study was done by, uh, you know, educated uh, urban folks, uh, but a study to sort of think about how does the, um, you know, the next half billion Indians think about issues of consent and this was a study a human centered design study to try and speak to ordinary indians in like four corners of the country urban rural etc and what that really found was uh, people as we know um, give give consent when they're asked to give consent but actually remain subliminally anxious about about signing off and people genuinely want a chance to assess the trade-offs which they really don't get and both these studies are in the public domain. I'm happy to share uh, share uh, details of this. But I think sure. this is just to emphasize the fact that really uh, this is a big issue. And in countries like ours, with challenges of literacy and digital readiness, and now with uh, you know um, hundreds of millions of Indians becoming first-time users of smartphones and apps, this problem is only going to get exacerbated. 
So we need to do something about it, right? So the first uh, line of solutions is on can consent be fixed? And uh, we've really, uh, you know, one of the things we've supported over the last uh, year are a series of uh, behavioral experiments with um, about um, uh, 5,000 Indians across the country on, on testing some promising approaches around fixing consent. And here are three or four interesting things which have come out. The first is, uh, I think this is also sort of well known, the defaults matter. Whatever is the default option tends to have the highest resonance. So if a privacy policy uh, has data sharing turned on by default, users get uh, concerned and uh, 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 has the data policy data sharing turned on, users tend to share far more information because that's the default option. But here's the really interesting one, right? Uh, this idea of cool down period. So what um, uh, the organization that did this, the Center for uh, Social and Behavior Change, um, they tested this idea of cool down periods, which is literally forcing people to stay on the privacy page of an app for a few minutes. And that tends to really help. Uh, it forces people to engage, so it increases comprehension and understandability. Uh, and more importantly, it also increases trust. Uh, they found that higher the people have a higher willingness to share more data uh, if they are made to do this cool down period exercise. Perhaps, and this is a hypothesis, maybe because it helps them, uh, it, they value the transparency that the business is providing by forcing them to be on this, on this, uh, on the. Uh, Varad, your mic is on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and the third idea, Anirudh, which I think was quite promising in this was the idea of rules of thumb or star rating. Now, we are, you know, we are familiar with this concept in different uh, contexts. But in India, you'll recall, uh, we have this appliance star ratings, which the Bureau of Energy Efficiency launched a few years ago. And every air conditioner, every refrigerator has a star rating. Fairly successful. And we tested this idea in the context of uh, privacy. Uh, and uh, it was clear that people were more willing to share, da share data with organizations that had higher privacy ratings uh, compared to those with lower ratings. And I think this is interesting both because I think people are looking for rule of thumb kind of uh, uh, help because it is a complex topic. It's also an opportunity, I think, for um, you know the upcoming regulator to think about these kind of ideas as a way of uh, making uh, making data privacy understandable to to common people. Uh, and I think the um, one of the takeaways, therefore, is that. Um, you know, consumer interests and business interests don't have to be at all. This is something Mr. Chandrasekhar was saying earlier, but the cool down period example is very, very clear that, you know, you, you are building trust by taking some of these steps. And I think that's the direction in which we need to move uh, as, um, as if we want consent to be, uh, to, to be fixed from where it is today. Uh, equally important, I think, is going beyond consent because we can't uh, rely Varad, I'll have to cut you off in 30 seconds. I think we'll okay. be running out of let time. So, share, yeah. Let me share with, share with you then one more example of where we sure. are learning sure. really interesting things, which is using entertainment education to empower citizens on uh, data privacy. So mm -hmm. this is a radio show which ran earlier this year across several markets in India, where 10 episodes in which a simple message on data privacy was part of a 15-minute entertainment show by a very popular radio show host called Nilesh Mishra. And I think here again, we learned a bunch of really interesting things. Uh, listeners get more privacy conscious and are less willing to share personal information if it is packaged well. Um, um, and I think just on the last point, I think the fact that these episodes were done in context in which people could relate, they're engrossing plots which are not just about the message, but actually an entertaining plot and a narrative style from a narrator they could relate to uh, really, really. So last thing I want to say is that really, uh, you know, empowering the citizen to engage in relatable ways and taking more control is probably the next uh, key frontier in the data privacy discourse. And I hope it will become more mainstream in years to come. Thank you. I think there are a couple of interesting takeaways for me. One is there is a need for much more advocacy on some of these issues uh, on how consumers should look at issues like consent, but also that uh, uh, building in more consent consciousness also requires adding a bit more friction to our online experience. And I think that's something that I would just like to uh, ask uh, Ms. Clave or Ms. Lee, what are your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, I'm happy to um, jump in. I mean, it's really interesting research. I'm I'm um, really delighted to see it. I'd like to follow up. I mean, this is something. Th- this issue, this kind of paradox that we find in ter- in terms of consent and notice and wanting to give people more information, but they don't read it. And how do you <laughs> how do you reach people without pushing them away? Um, is you know, as as you recognize, is a longstanding issue um, that we that I don't think the world has gotten a good answer to yet, right? Um, and I do think recognizing that differences in groups and populations and uh, age and ethnicity, all of these things go into how someone approaches um, uh, learning about their privacy options um, and that companies have to figure out ways to approach people on their terms. Um, there is no one size fits all approach to communicating about privacy. And I think um, it's important for any regulation to to recognize that. But also this is where the DPA is going to play a really critical role, um, hopefully in convening multi-stakeholder processes um, to, to further um, explore these issues and maybe develop new approaches um, that haven't been contemplated. So I, I do want to flag one thing that Facebook has been working on. We published a white paper last summer exactly on this issue of communicating about privacy and pointing out the, the very issues we're talking about. Um, and we have been convening uh, roundtables around the world to further explore these ideas. Um, we will be holding one um, in India in January um, that you know, we will extend invitations to folks. Um, and what the, the plan is to convene experts who can really think about new ways forward. Um, and whether that's a kind of industry codes of conduct that depend on uh, vary by sector, whether it's um, uh, kind of flexible approaches um, to consent that really prioritize some of these new modalities we're talking about. Um, I think it will be important to kind of come together and think creatively around this um, and recognize that most importantly, there is not one approach. And so I think that just to circle back to your original point about the friction, I mean, it's really interesting. And I think it points out um, it, it's counterintuitive, right? We all want to, consumers typically say they want to get onto services quickly. That's part of why they don't like consent pop-ups and notifications, right? And they kind of just click through them. Um, so what happens if you, it's, it's, it's interesting, counterintuitive to think about making, making people um, read things and what does that produce? And, you know, I think all ideas should be on the table at this point in terms of how to effectively communicate. So we absolutely look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. Uh, actually, that's a great segue into the next part of the discussion I had planned out on the Data Protection Authority, but uh, I just wanted to give um, Ms. Lee a chance to come into this in case uh, you had any comments. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so I think, first of all, I should probably um, start by saying that AWS is a data processor. We're not typically data fiduciaries, um, but our customers are. So um, I'm really kind of responding to this from the perspective of my previous hat actually as a uh, as a as being part of the personal data protection commission in singapore so as a dpa um Communing for consent is is a challenging thing. I think that over the years we've been doing better. You know, there's been a lot of really cool strategies being employed by um, a lot of data fiduciaries to try and improve that clarity of what people are consenting for. But I think um, at the end of the day, it's a fairly complicated issue. And I think ultimately, when we go back to the first principles, I think that is the main reason for why a lot of data protection authorities have been increasingly moving away from the consent model. I'm not a lawyer, but when I talk to lawyers, they always tell me that consent actually doesn't protect people. Um, it's, and, and if there are lawyers in the room who disagree, please, please let me know. But um, consent doesn't actually protect people. It doesn't protect individuals. What it does is it makes it very easy for companies or you know, for, for, for bigger entities to basically say that, well, you've agreed now, so too right. bad. <laughs> You know, um, and 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 most individuals, when you are giving consent, you know, it might be at the point in time for that purpose, you're okay with it, but things change. And withdrawal of consent has been a really interesting debate that's been going on as well. Um, so mm-hmm. I would strongly encourage that as um, as the Indian government thinks about um, consent and meaningful consent, 
one of the most interesting parts of the conversation really is about how do you make it easier for people to withdraw consent. And I think for a lot of individuals, um, when you, for example, sign up to an email subscription, you might sign up to a thousand email subscriptions. You don't even know who you consented to at some point. Um, and, and it's not that easy to withdraw consent in a lot of these cases. So I think, I think withdrawal of consent is almost more important in my mind than giving that consent in the first instance. And I think with that, that's where the accountability frameworks are so important because part of that is ensuring that a company is, you know, says what they do, right? Um, so if, if they relied on consent to begin with, fine. If they relied on another basis for processing, fine. But at the end of the day, if they no longer need that data, they should get rid of that data. If they, you know, if they've changed their purpose, you know, even if it's technically possible, it can be read into it, but it wasn't something that the individual could have reasonably expected at the point of consenting, then they should think about whether they, you know, should seek fresh consent. Um, and certainly, you know, if an individual wants to withdraw consent, they need to think about the processes to make that easier. So um, just a couple of uh, perspectives there. So let me... Uh keep you under the spotlight while I segue into talking about the DPA and you've had experience of building out a DPA uh, being part of the process. So I just wanted to ask your thoughts on what do you think are the challenges or the teething issues a data protection agency might face? And I'm asking this in the context of India because we obviously want a very uh, highly capable DPA, but broadly our regulatory capacity is not comparable to many developed countries. So we'll have to make harder choices in some sense in how to optimize our capacity and what are the priorities for the data protection authority, at least in the initial years. So any thoughts on how we should think about doing this? Definitely, and I'm happy to jump into that. So I, I was with Singapore for the first four years as they were kind of um, you know, setting, uh, implementing the Data Protection Act. Um, and. Uh, and <laughs> challenges of a D DPA are, are manifold. Um, I think uh, the first most important thing is ensuring that the DPA is independent and, uh, and has the appropriate powers, especially where the DPA also has to regulate the government um, in some cases. Uh, that becomes a, a particularly challenging um, um, issue. Uh, for better or for worse, in Singapore, um, the DPA does not cover the government agencies, but even then we had to play quite an active role in educating our government agency counterparts. So ensuring that you know they have the right mandate, that they are independent, um, that they are staffed with the right people, who, um, and data protection is a fairly legalistic and technical issue. So ensuring that you have the right people in there who can create very important and solid um, case law as well, you know, as it's being as it's being created over the years. So so that's that's the first one. I think the second one is really thinking about prioritizing the DPA's resources. Um, I would say that in the from the act design, there are many elements that you can start with already to ensure that the DPA is not overburdened. So for example, um, minimizing any pre-approval requirements um, will you know, help the DPA a lot. Um, you know, giving and giving powers to the DPA to um, have exceptions to requirements under the Act as well um, uh, does does provide that kind of flexibility over and above that, or at least um, table exceptions to a minister who can then get that approved. You know, um, um, you know, obviously with um, due process and appropriate checks and balances, right. um, and then uh, also ensuring that um, certain requirements, such as for example, data breach notification requirements, that you don't end up in a situation where DPA becomes over notified. Uh, we had an interesting problem in, in Singapore, uh, this very, very specific and weird one, where our law didn't allow us, or it wasn't clear, that it allowed us to reject um, uh, a, a particular process. So this is where an individual has asked for access to their data or asked for correction of their data. And, um, and you know, maybe uh, it was a, a very frivolous request. Um, and, and we didn't realize until it was amended, but we didn't realize that um, uh, the law actually did not give the DPA the power to reject those requests. So I had a very weird situation where I either had to convince complainants to withdraw because you know we couldn't delete that data for them and you know it wasn't it wasn't appropriate. Um, but in some cases where we were not able to, um, I have I, I will not kid you. This is a real situation. One of my colleagues spent uh, read through about uh, I don't know you know fifty pages worth of WhatsApp messages for a very, very frivolous dispute because someone wanted to, I don't know, get back at their florist 
you know, because she had been saying mean things in a group of mutual friends. It was ridiculous. So, so don't, don't, don't make sure that you have the powers to be able to, um, you know, carry out processes in a particular way and reject processes in a particular way. Um, so that's, that's really about prioritization. Um, regulating at scale is also very important. So what we realized is um, SMEs in particular were very confused by new data protection requirements. And so um, ensuring that there are some ready-made tools that you can just share with SMEs already um, and, and building out you know, very simple to follow training programs did a lot to, um, I think, allay those concerns. Um, uh, the Philippines also has done really good things on that. So um, probably worth considering looking there too. Um, and there are lots of resources internationally. And then finally, I would say, and this is a tough one, but I would say, um, think about effective enforcement. So, so often, you know, a law that is too unwieldy, that requires too complicated investigations that then maybe will result in yielding no, no decisions or directions against companies, it looks like a toothless law. And so it wasn't until about two years in, at which point we had about a backlog of 100 investigations um, when we issued our first decision. After that first decision, companies started paying a bit more attention. So while I don't think it's the right approach to to punish by by making a point, I think it's important to note that if a regulator is not able to demonstrate their effectiveness because the law is too complicated or you know too too technical to implement, then um, then uh, you know you might have a situation where then people look at the law and say it is not important, you know, and I'm not going to be caught, so I don't care. And and that's that would be uh, I think the worst outcome for India if if you have a data protection law, but it's not um, it's being ignored. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you. That's really insightful. We uh, have a lot of ground to cover and I want to keep some time for audience questions. So if anyone has any short comments on the issue of the DPA and its capacity, please jump in and make a quick comment. Yeah. Can I just jump in for a second? I'm also uh, a former regulator. That's how I know Annabelle actually from our, our prior work together. Um, just two things I wanted to highlight. One, I think given the the enormous task ahead of the, the DPA before it, um, cooperation is going to be key. And I think two, two things are important to call out. One, I think it's really incredibly important and great that the law includes this idea of regulatory sandboxes, which is really a cutting edge tool that we're seeing, especially Singapore, the DPA there has made enormous strides. It's an innovative regulatory solution. It's about problem solving together in a, in a, in a, in a safe, privacy protective environment between the regulator and companies. Um, and I think, um, I think India is the first law where we've actually seen it spelled out in the law. So I think that's a great forward looking innovation. The second thing I would say is um, the DPA should join the international community of enforcement authorities and rely on its peers um, to uh, for their expertise. Um, there's been a ton of great work done internationally around um, best practices for investigations, you know, the technical expertise um, to draw on. So a world of uh, resources and relationships will open up uh, to the regulator um, that would be really great to take advantage of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Yeah, look, uh, I, you know, I, I, I caught a bit, a bit of uh, Varad's presentation and I, I would... Uh, argue that the real the real focus if there is a focus uh, at this stage has to be about creating the right dpa you know the, we can be right on 45 out of the 90 and we can be wrong on the 46th out of the 92 clauses in this bill but what we've absolutely got to get right is the ability to create an institution that can oversee on behalf of both the consumers and the other stakeholders that we are going to be important participants in this uh, data economy, uh, the capacity, the capability, the flexibility, the powers of enforcement, all of that needs to be very carefully. And I think that is simply the most important part of the bill. The rest of the stuff is, you know, reasonably intuitive. I mean, I, you know, yeah, there are going to be some uh, uh, changes uh, uh, um, on in clauses and so on and so forth. But getting the DPA right, especially in the Indian context, not so much in the U.S. and Singaporean context, because we have a very bad record of having regulators that actually uphold consumer uh, interest. And whether it's competition law or it is the TRI, I noticed Mr. Sharma is on a uh, 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 guest on this. We've had an absolutely poor record of enforcement and, uh, and partly because the laws have been uh, 
uh, badly weakly drafted they they're you know decades old uh, but we've got to get that right this in this bill uh, for sure right thank you uh, i think i'll need to cut short our discussion and take some questions okay. from the audience uh, we have about 10 minutes left so first question is for mr chandrashekhar and uh, this is uh, a question about uh, the need for urgency for the need uh, launching of the data protection bill and the question is what is the sense of urgency that the government of india has to launch the data protection bill and uh, why is there this sense of urgency no i mean I, look i think the, the the supreme court uh, in a petition in which i was a petitioner ruled that the uh, every citizen has a fundamental right to privacy in 2016 and uh, we still ha- don't have the legislative framework and so what what that does in the absence of a cl- of a clear legislative framework is that you are just creating uh, you know fear and uh, confusion in both business and in in amongst consumers so so a legislative framework is a right thing to do mm. in terms of urgency i can only tell you this throughout this pandemic the only committee that has actually had in person meetings almost Three four days a week for the last five months four months has been the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Data Protection. So we treat it as urgent. Uh, our chairperson Mrs. Lakey treats it as urgent. Urgent. Um, now the government will speak on its own. I I don't believe that they don't think this is urgent. This is a good thing, uh, and this uh, a legislative framework like this is good for the country and good for every stakeholder in this uh, digital economy, present and the future. Absolutely. uh thank you for that uh the next question is directed at uh, melinda uh the question is when companies like facebook are doing business around the globe it's very important to know how facebook has been dealing with privacy issues and challenges faced by the circulation of offensive comments so uh i think this goes to the idea of uh hate speech or abusive speech on platforms Yeah, so <clears throat> um I I'm not the expert in in the hate speech and offensive content on the platform. I know that we have extremely strong measures in place that we're constantly um iterating and working to improve. Um so unfortunately I I I am not able to go deep on those, but I can speak to um the privacy protection um uh part of that question which is to say um Absolutely, we do have strong privacy protections in place um, for everyone around the world, for all of our users around the world. Um, and uh, you know, I think what is what is clear is that although there are some um, divergences shaping up uh, in in data protection regimes ar- around the world, on the whole. there is more in common uh there are more commonalities than there are differences and so users around the world can can expect certain things from um Facebook and Facebook pro- uh, companies um including strong rights to their personal data um strong internal measures to ensure the the security and the protection of data um a, a accountability internally um robust policies that are in place and um oversight by appropriate regulators um through strong enforcement mechanisms so um and i think that you know actually we have uh, pr- dis- despite the challenges of communicating with people about privacy um we do take pretty strong measures um both in our data policy which is interactive um in in you know uh relatively easy to understand lang- language compared to kind of uh, the terms of service we are used to seeing um and in how we communicate with people over the their lifetime of experience on the platform about their privacy because as we all know it isn't just about the initial sign up and dumping a bunch of information on people but mm-hmm. coming back to people over the lifespan of their interaction to say hey do you want to check your privacy settings hey do you want to turn this off why am i seeing this ad well here's why so continuing to work on all of those um aspects of our products as well as important to making sure people's data is protected thank you and the the next one is a general question uh, which basically goes to the question of strategic autonomy and the question is basically about uh whether implementing a law that's more or less in consonance with global frameworks actually compromises uh, india's sovereignty and also the opportunity for growth 
Uh, anyone who would like to take a stab at it? I can do it, please. Please. No, no, go ahead, uh, Annabelle, if you, if you want to do that. Uh, sorry, no, I, I, I was just going to provide a brief intervention, um, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, I think uh, from my perspective, um, I, I would say that every data protection law is different. Um, and it doesn't matter at the end of the day what the, well, it does matter, but, you know, when you read the text of a law, it doesn't necessarily express the spirit of the law and how it's being applied in that country. So what I've seen is, is candidly speaking, um, every single country, um, regardless of what they've written in the law, will implement it in a manner that is consistent with what privacy means in, in that con context locally. Um, and uh, what's therefore very important is that they start from a base that um, enables them to then have that interoperability conversation with other countries. Sometimes that's very difficult when the laws um, are written in ways that are too different. Um, but what I've seen is that broadly speaking, the laws, the law can you know be very similar in writing, but the spirit of implementation can, can vary quite a lot from country to country. And that's still... Um, you know, it's still very possible for laws to be interoperable, even taking into account every single country's different approach to privacy. Um, but, but please uh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, look, uh, I think Anur, the, this issue of strategic autonomy and uh, let us say sovereignty is an issue that has crept in uh, over the last two, three years into what otherwise was a fairly normal conversation on data protection and big tech regulation. And uh, it has, it is not without merit. I think there is, there are some aspects of this that we need to take into account and we need to uh, think through while we enact these laws. Uh, however, I come from, I come from a school of thought that these, these should not be rigid walls. I think uh, strategic autonomy is a, is an idea, is a concept. Uh, the time has come for us to look at it. Uh, the fact that free flow of data between uh, geographies has to be something that has to be scrutinized. Uh, but at the same time, I don't believe the answer is hard-coded legislative intervention that says to protect strategic autonomy, you thou shall store all your data in this district of India. I mean, I don't, I just don't believe that. I think uh, the ease of doing business, the flexible, uh, the, the issues of choice and competition, all of those have to be taken into account and balanced with the fact that if Indian data is going out, it goes out to jurisdictions that government is comfortable with. Uh, right. We don't want this to go out into the hands of people who misuse it. So I think from that, if you look at strategic autonomy from, from that context, uh, and not necessarily from a context of trying to push uh, uh, being an Indian data center provider and you, know, you suddenly want to use this uh, sovereignty argument to push for a little piece of the business for yourself, um, then it's okay. I think strategic autonomy is a genuine issue. Uh, sovereignty is a is a is a is a reasonable issue to be focused on, but we should be flexible in how we approach it, and we should look at this as multiple friendly jurisdictions, uh, jurisdictions of trust. Uh, and like I said, this bill actually in the preamble says talks about trust, and it is also about creating trans-border trust uh, between entities and uh, sovereigns. So I think that is the way we should approach this. Right. Uh, and if I made yeah. one point yeah. was just as firstly, I think, I mean, it's great that uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar and the committee are, are meeting copiously over the last year. And it's fabulous to see the kind of effort they're putting in. And it's great to see the representation across party lines and, and et cetera on, the, and on that committee. So I'm sure they'll come up with a law which is fit for purpose for the country. I also feel there's also an opportunity for us to um, really uh, take advantage of being somewhat later than the other countries and create something which is truly, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't even say world class. I would say like, a, a, you know, a role model for the rest of the world, which is still to come up with data protection legislation. I think the idea of this being truly citizen first for countries like ours where people are at very different levels in their digital journey is an important concept. I think the idea of level playing field for small businesses I don't think folks, uh, GDPR, for example, is that good at on, on that, for example. Uh, I think being adaptive, as Mr. Chandrasekhar said, not sort of um, hard coding everything. This is a space which is going to evolve in dramatic ways, uh, being adaptive. And last but not the least, I think just ensuring the right kind of skill sets in this in the regulator for, uh, you know, truly uh, forward looking 21st century uh, space, 
Uh, unlike um, you know many of the historical le- regulators, although we have a lot to learn from many of our historic regulators, this has to look and feel different for the future of uh, future of the country. Thank you. I think that's a really optimistic and fantastic note to end this discussion on. I'd have loved to continue this, but thank you all so much for your time, and this was a really great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.